into the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. To worship so like I can see your heart and everything within every burning inside signal fire of grace of creation sings your praises so Stars are made to worship so speak a hundred billion 
and they are to the bone. They're sweet to my soul, and I'm swept away. to the bone, you speak life to the soul, and I'm swept away.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're glad you're with us. Uh, kind of a special holiday, holiday, quote unquote, uh, celebrating those who've given their lives, ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And so hopefully you take this seriously. I, uh, we have lost a cousin in, in um, uh, Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah, so this is really personal to us. And maybe you've lost loved ones, uh, friends also. Uh, welcome. Glad that you're with us. Um, it's a little chilly outside. It's nice and warm in here, right? <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. And we're a church uh, reaching a tri-state area with vision to be a church. The unchurched love to experience. And so the reason we do some of the things the way we do might be a little different than some other churches is so that uh, kind of artificial things don't get in the way of the gospel. <coughs> so that's our vision statement, uh, we have a motto uh, that we go by here, and it's this, sometimes we say it together, following Jesus, changing together. And so what we talk about and what the songs are about is positive change in our lives. So this next coming weekend is going to be really busy, and hopefully you'll, you'll join us. Uh, first, there's Smithsburg Days on Saturday, the 5th, from I believe it's 10 to 5, and we as a church actually been asked by the uh, town of Smithsburg to man the children's tent, um, children's zone. Uh, we've done this in the past. Uh, to do that, we need volunteers. We need people <laughs> to help uh, with the crafts and the games with the children. So it's at, uh, at the park this year. It's a different location. And we have a sign-up sheet out there if you can help just for an hour. We'd appreciate that. And some folks are going to be here all day long. But uh, please, be in prayer, show up, um, enjoy the day, and also help uh, minister to our community. That's one reason <laughs> we are in Smithsburg, to, to serve our community. But then the next day, which is a Sunday, day of worship, is also going to be something we're going to try and do a little more uh, connecting. <laughs> Since the past year, it's been almost impossible. So we're going to have a church picnic, and for safety reasons, we're going to say, just bring you food for yourself. Bring yourself a packed lunch. We'll provide you drinks and paper products. There's going to be games. And so please, please, uh, come. You have to eat lunch anyway. It's not too difficult to pack up your food. And come join us uh, next Sunday afternoon. We'd love to connect with you. And uh, we do have connect cards out in the lobby if you want to do it here in person. But those, especially those who are watching, uh, there's a digital connect card. So you can submit prayer requests or decisions or questions or whatever you want to put on there. Hopefully something good. And uh, uh, we'll respond to that. Uh, especially the prayer requests get distributed by email. And if you'd like to be on that list, put that on there. I'd like to receive the prayer request list and other announcements from the church. So uh, please take advantage of that. And then we're at our offering time. We have an opportunity to concretely, physically, materially, financially return a portion of what God has given to us. I'm thinking about not the next series, but the following series talking about money because it, affects, it impacts us all, and the Bible has a lot to say about it. Um, and so worship, part of worship is physically offering something to God. Time next Saturday, finances uh, either website, app, or through the mail, or here if you're present, you can put in the offering plate at the back. So let's pray together. <coughs> Father God, thank you. We thank you for worship. We thank you for offering time. It's a wonderful way to show our thankfulness and appreciation and also uh, reach out. This is some, a way we can uh, give to causes here and as well as around the world so good news could be spread. <coughs> And this weekend especially, we're thankful for people that have given their lives uh, so that we can live in a country with as many freedoms as we do have. And it makes us mindful of you, Jesus, who gave the altar of sacrifice for us all. Uh, God, use these offerings uh, to further your kingdom and to give you glory. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. 
By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain, and for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. We're in a series called Essential Faith, a pretty important series, I believe. It's really been beneficial to me and hopefully to you. Today's topic it really impacts faith, and that's God's no. Now, I got thinking about the word no. No is a word we don't like very much. Think back when you were a child, and you would ask your parents for stuff, and sometimes they would say what? No. And usually you weren't too happy about that. If they didn't want to eat their broccoli and you said, no, you have to eat your broccoli or spinach or whatever vegetable it is, you, you don't care for it. Or if you wanted to stay up late and they said no. Uh, and then you got to be a teenager and then it got to, uh, can I borrow the keys to the car? And they would say no. Or can I go here? And they would say no. And sometimes we'd sneak off and go there anyway. But anyway, it's a different topic. Um, so we really don't like the word no. And as a parent, when those of us who are parents, as a parent, it's a really bad habit to get into is just to say no without even thinking about it. We say no so often to our kids for their safety that we, we sometimes have good reasons and other times we don't have a good reason. It's just kind of a bad habit we have. But we're not perfect parents and so we make mistakes when we say no. But what is the response as a child when you tell them no? What's the, what's the response usually? Why? You ever get asked, why? Why can't I do this? Why can't I stay up? Why can't I go here? Why can't I see this person? Whatever it might be. We often hear the response, why? And like I said, sometimes we have good reasons. Sometimes it's because I said so. It's not a good reason, right, as a parent. So what about when God says no? I'm assuming you've experienced this. <laughs> What happens when God says no, especially when you and I consider it a legitimate request? Maybe you're out of work. Uh, I need a job. And, and you didn't get to, you, you go a period of time without a job. God, why are you not giving me a job? Maybe you're single and you want to be married. God, I, you know, just make me happy. Well, I, I will hopefully please you with this. Uh, why are you not, uh, somebody talked in the first service about wanting to have children, never had children. That's a biggie, right? Um, God, wh wh why? So that's really difficult, especially when God seems to be silent. He doesn't even seem to be out there. He doesn't seem to be hearing what you're saying. So how do you and I deal with God's no? So a quick review here for some of you that maybe missed some of the series. We started out asking the question, what is faith? <laughs> a word we throw around a lot, what does it mean? It's fundamental to any relationship, 
certainly are fundamental to a, a religious relationship, the relationship with Almighty God. So we ask then, what is the foundation of it? Uh, to help us define it, we need to know what the foundation of faith is. Foundation is the most important thing that you can't build a structure without a good foundation. So what's the foundation of faith? And we came across <coughs> uh, the answer or the solution or the, uh, what we believe is the foundation is a person, a historical person, a historical event. This name, a guy named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago in, in present-day Israel. He was a Jewish rabbi. He lived a perfect life. We, tr we believe that because his book says so. He lived a perfect life, which is beyond comprehension, he but he was all God, fully God and fully man. Uh, then, he, then he was executed. He was tortured and executed, uh, unjustly, obviously. Three days later, rose from the dead, resurrected, walked around here on earth for like 40 days. H hundreds of people saw him and testified the fact that he died and was resurrected. And that is the foundation of our faith. And unless that changes, and it hasn't changed for 2,000 years, and if it's a historical event, it can't change, that is the foundation of our faith. It's not whether we get our prayers answered the way we want or not. It's not if things turn out the way we want. Um, so the question is, do we still believe, in this case, when God says no? And so we came up with a definition. I have, in, in 40 years of being a pastor, I've never written my own personal definition of faith, which I thought was kind of strange. And so I came up with one. It's not perfect, but this is one that, that works for me and maybe works for some of you. Absolute confidence that God is who he says he is. This book says he is. All right? Absolute confidence. I don't doubt that God is like God says he is. And the best way to understand what God is like is look at Jesus, all right? So I have complete confidence in that. And so consequently then that he will do everything he has promised. Part of his character is that he will keep his promises. So faith is connected with God's promises. In fact, we ask, what's the bridge between, well, I'm going to use the word hope and faith. You know, when you and I pray, we pray for lots of things. Um, a lot, I don't know what percentage, some percentage of that is hope or wishful thinking. This is what I would like to happen. <laughs> but I can have faith that it will happen if I had a promise from God. So we spoke, took a week and talked about that. And at the end of that, I gave you three big promises of God. First, His presence. God has promised you his presence. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. Now, most of the time, that's a, that's a comfort, isn't it? But sometimes we kind of like to lead God away, off, away if we want him into, into something we shouldn't be into, right? <laughs> and, uh, but that's silly, right? He sees everything. He's always present. His grace, and we're going to talk about that more, so I won't mention it here because it connects with our topic for today when God says no, and his mercy. Anytime when we don't get what we deserve, deserve, whether it's we don't get a speeding ticket or we don't get, you know, in trouble with our parents or whatever it might be, or, or teachers, or our boss, whatever, that's God's mercy. So back to our topic for the day, we word it this way. What do you and I do when God doesn't give us what we hope for? I don't have a promise from God, but I really would like this to happen, and it doesn't happen. And some of us, uh, well, whatever age we are, if you think back when you were a teenager, some of your hopes and dreams you had for life, and probably none of us saw all that come to fruition, did we? Whether it was a uh, profession you went into, uh, where you're going to live here on this planet, um, whether you got married or not, and the person you married to, um, none of us had to except for me, got a perfect spouse, right? <laughs> so we had this vision or this dream of this perfect spouse, and nobody can fit that mold because none of us are perfect. So what do you do when God doesn't give you what you hope for? And I don't want to belittle this because for some of, this, this, some of us, this has been devastating, especially if that first marriage didn't work out for you. 
that can be really devastating. Um, if you really wanted children and never were able to have children, that can be devastating. In fact, so devastating, some people, maybe some of you watching or here, uh, walked away from Jesus or maybe walked away from, from God uh, for a period or a session or time in your life. <coughs> so we're going to look at, I think, is an answer to this question. And we're going to look at a character, a uh, very familiar p character from the New Testament, a guy named Paul. Now, Paul was a very passionate person about his beliefs. He was a religious leader, a Jewish religious leader, so he's passionate about those beliefs, so passionate that he persecuted people that followed Jesus. He thought that was a ripoff of Judaism, and he even participated in, in people being killed for faith in Jesus. He had this encounter with Jesus. Um, his life was dramatically changed. Now he became a proponent of Jesus just as passionately. And most importantly, he took the gospel to non-Jewish people, which most of us are. And so we are directly impacted by the fact, fact that he took the gospel to, the Bible calls them Gentiles. <coughs> so Paul was very successful at that. Uh, he started churches in Turkey, uh, present-day Turkey and Greece. He eventually wound up in Rome, the center of the world in his day. Uh, he ultimately died for his faith. But he was very well known, very popular, very successful. Uh, a lot of the New Testament stuff is things he wrote. So we're going to talk about something he wrote 2,000 years later. How much more successful can you be than that? Now, there's a big danger when you're successful, isn't it? We see it in the non-religious world and we see it in the religious world. And that danger is what the Bible calls is pride. And there's a verse in the Bible that says, pride comes before, who knows what that next word is? A fall, exactly. And we see it in the, in the political realm, we see it in the, in the entertainment world, we see it, in, uh, unfortunately, in the church. Some of these uh, pastors of big churches have fallen. Uh, it goes back to pride. So, Paul was going to have to deal with a big no in his life. And as we read the text, you're going to see he gives the cause, or he believes what the cause is, and it's connected with this danger of pride. This is in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. <clears throat> Again, Paul's been very successful. He's performed miracles. In this text, he talks about seeing this uh, heavenly vision that none of us have probably seen. So he had this, you know, connection with God that, uh, at a deeper level than most of us probably. And so then he says, okay, so I, I've experienced all this. I've seen this divine vision. So to keep me from becoming proud, because I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to mess up God's work. So <clears throat> later on in life, he's looking back and he's saying, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given something. <laughs> what was he given? He was given a thorn in his flesh. Now, nobody knows what this is, and I think it's good because if I had the same thing Paul had, I might become proud. In fact, hey, Paul and I are, are kind of alike, so we don't know what it is. Probably something to do with physical because it uses the word flesh. Uh, one I kind of like is possibly um, epilepsy because it was something that would belittle him. It was something that he interpreted as would be a hindrance to spreading the gospel. And some of these others, like poor eyesight, I don't know how that would be a hindrance. But we don't know what it is. But it was a, in fact, he describes it as a messenger from Satan to do what? Torment. That's a pretty strong word, right? I was given this ailment um, to torment me, but for a good reason to keep me from becoming proud. We would say to keep him humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We're going to talk about grace. So again, a man of great faith, we would say. A man of great faith. Uh, 
he was stoned and had all kinds of persecution. He died for his faith. Um, so he goes on in the text. In fact, well, let me read this verse out of the message paraphrase. I thought there was some good concepts in here. So not, I wouldn't get a big head. That's kind of proud, right? So I wouldn't get a big head. I was given, notice this phrase, the gift of a handicap. Now, most of the time we don't think of handicaps as being gifts. But he said this gift, this, was a, this handicap was a gift. Why was it a gift, Paul? To keep me in constant touch with my limitations, which is always a good thing. Now, Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What, in fact, he did was he didn't get him down, even though this was tormenting him. What was the b bottom line result? It did was push me to my knees. Okay? So we're going to look at a few minutes. We're going to look at this. Get me down and push me to my knees. No danger, then, of walking around high and mighty. So what did Paul do in this situation? He's got this handicap that's tormenting him. What would you do? Paul did the same thing. He asked God, hey, I don't like this. Please take it away. Please remove it. Text says it this way. Three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. If I'm being tormented, I'm going to be begging God to take this torment away. Now, three times. Three times doesn't mean he prayed today, he prayed the next day, and he prayed the next day and said, okay, I'm going to stop praying. No, 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 no. <laughs> What it means is three, um, what's the best way to say it? Periods of time. So maybe uh, a w several weeks or a month goes by that he's constantly praying, God, God, I need you to take this away. Please take this away. Take it away. And so for several weeks he's praying, and then he, he, he puts it aside for a while. And maybe months pass or a year pass, and he's still being tormented, and he he, he spends a time of maybe prayer and fasting, and he's at begging God, please take this away, day after day after day, and eventually he stops. Three times he does this, all right? And I picture Paul doing the same thing you and I do, and that's debating with God. Now, now God, you, you, you know this is hindering, uh, you know, me being the best missionary I can be, be and spreading the gospel for you. It would be best for your kingdom and for for the cause of your, your cause and for Christianity, for you to remove this. You ever try and debate with God? Try and convince him that what you want is better than what he wants? Anyway, I can imagine Paul doing that. That's what I would do. That's what I have done. So we asked this question a week or so ago. What can you ask God? Because he's asking God for something here. What can you and I ask of God? And what was the answer? Anything, everything, right? But here's the caveat. This is really important. We can ask him anything, but he has the right to do what? Say no. In fact, I think he has the responsibility to say no. Think of you as a parent. When you tell your child no to something that's dangerous to them, it's more than just telling them no. It's your responsibility to take care of that child to tell that child no. So that's the same thing with our God. Now, part of our issue, part of our problem is this. God's silence often, we mistake it for his, for, for his absence. Well, God, you're not answering me. You're not answering me. Maybe you're not there. Maybe you're not hearing me. And so don't mistake God's silence for his absence. So Paul learned something, and he's going to share what he learned with us about when God said no in, his, in this case. So, God gave him an answer eventually. In fact, three times, evidently, God answered him. What was his answer? Each time he said to me, my grace, Paul, my grace is all you need. And if I'm Paul, I said, no, that's not what I need. <laughs> I need to be healed. I need this to be removed from me. This is tormenting me. <clears throat> now, what was the definition of grace? There's lots of definitions of grace. But in this context, the one I gave you last week, I think, uh, serves us well. Um, so this is all you need, Paul, is my grace. What is my grace? It's the strength, ability, or energy to endure, in his case, the torment. So no, Paul, I'm not going to remove it. My answer is no, but I'm going to give you something better. <laughs> God's grace is always good, right? <clears throat> now, 
I believe we've all experienced this. We've all experienced a no. In fact, I'm going to share a very uh, traumatic one to our family uh, at the end of the message today. We've all experienced God's no. How have we dealt with it? Whether it's a financial issue, we, you know, keep treading water financially, relationship issue, we just uh, can't get our marriage fixed, or I can't find that person to marry. Um, maybe it's a health issue, like with Paul. What do you do? Now, again, grace is a good thing. So to resist God's grace, say, okay, I'm Paul, I'm saying, no, God, I don't want your grace, I want the healing. <laughs> to resist God's grace, to resist God's will is to resist His grace. And I think in our good moments, we would say, I don't want to resist God's grace, right? So I basically have two options when God says no. You can shake your fist at God and say, okay, God, if you're not going to do this, then thanks, but no thanks, I'm not going to follow you anymore. That's one option, right? In fact, some people do that. Some of you may have done that. Maybe some of you are there right now. The other option is, as that paraphrase said, drive us to our knees. Cause us to lean in, lean more, depend more on God. See, our lives here on earth, as Jesus following, if you're not, we're so glad you're watching and listening, uh, is what I call character development. As a parent, that's part of our job with our children, right? Character development. So by the time they're, quote, unquote, 18, they are mature adults, uh, mature enough to go up to be able to be called adults. So God is trying to build character in you and I. As we said, I think, last week, if you always got what you want, you'd be what? Spoiled brats, not very good character development, not maturity. So God wants to mature us. And so one way he does that is by not giving us everything we, we want, everything we think we want. <clears throat> so one way to think about that, this is this. Paul wouldn't get his miracle. He didn't get his healing. But he would be a miracle. The fact that he was able to do all he did, despite his handicap, is in some ways a greater miracle. So the text goes on. Every time God answered me, all three times, he said, my grace is all you need. What do you mean? Well, my power, whose power? God's power. My power works best in weakness. Ah, that's interesting. So when I am weak, he's going to say this later, you got her strong, right? So I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses. And he's going to talk about that again in the next verse. And and we'll see how much many of us are at that place. But his reason is so that God, Christ, uh, the power of Christ can work through me. I need his power much more effective than my power, more powerful than my power or my limited power. So <clears throat> Paul, in some ways, is more astounding that he accomplished what he did despite, the word, we'll use the word handicap. So he quit asking. He came to the place where he realized, well, I understand how this is better for your kingdom than if you heal me. And he stopped asking. <clears throat> now let me ask you, have you ever gotten into trouble? <laughs> well, how should I say that? Gotten into potential trouble and not got caught. For example, I think I use this illustration. You're speeding and you see that siren behind you and... Somebody did get caught recently, but anyway. Um, they go right by you because somebody else is driving faster maybe. Um, or, you know, uh, maybe she's pregnant. I hope she's not. Or maybe I'm pregnant. I hope I'm not. Or something to do with work or whatever situation. And you got through it okay. Uh, you didn't get in trouble. Your parents didn't catch you. You went where you shouldn't have went, and they didn't catch you. You got away with it, okay? Let me ask you something. How much character development does that bring in, back in your life? I would wager to tell you less character development. 
begin to think, hey, I can get away with stuff. And you have a tendency to continue to do those things. It doesn't bring about much character development when we skirt by. <clears throat> we aren't changed. We're not positively changed. So we get to the place where we say, okay, God, put this on your outline. God, if you don't, it won't. If you don't do it, it won't happen. If you don't heal me, it's not going to happen. And I think it's a good way to preach, approach, approach every day of our lives. Get up and say, okay, God, I need your power today. If I don't have your power today, I can't be the parent I, I need to be. I can't be the child I, I, ne- I need to be. I can't be the employee. I can't be the Jesus follower without. If you don't, it won't. <clears throat> so the good part of God's no is this. When God says no, I am most dependent. I am most dependent on him. And that's a good thing. So Paul goes on and says, I take pleasure in my weaknesses, and he lists them, all right? Now, I couldn't say I take pleasure in most of these things. I don't take pleasure in insults, do you? Um, hardships, persecution, and troubles that I suffer. Again, not because of my own doing, but I suffer for Christ. So there it is, he, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Ah, kind of a paradox, huh? So our greatest weakness is God's greatest opportunity to show himself strong in you. So he gets the glory. Hey, that's what it should be about, right? Again, whether it's a relationship issue, a financial issue, a a health issue, whatever it might be. Or you can walk away. And my wife and I have done counseling for many years, and and we'll, we'll meet with one couple, and they're willing to humble themselves and believe what God says and make changes in their lives, and their marriage gets better, and others refuse. And usually things just deteriorate and get worse. People. doesn't have to be a couple. I can't talk about this without talking about Jesus. God always answered his prayers, right? Last night of his life, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying. In fact, the text says he prays three times. What does he pray three times for? I don't want to die. <laughs> I don't want to suffer and then die. Three times, God said. But he ended his prayer, like I said, we talked about last week. But your will be done, Father. I'm willing to do what you want to do. And, of course, for all our sakes, he had to die. And so he was willing to die. And so God didn't answer his prayer the way he wanted for our good, for the greater good, if you will. Came across this great quote. If you decide to walk away, the only thing worse than being disappointed with God is disappointing without God. It becomes more complicated, becomes more painful, becomes more regrets, becomes more bad memories. So bottom line is this, it takes a lot more faith to endure a no, comes from God, than to receive a yes from him. Wouldn't you agree? <clears throat> this weekend would have been the 22nd wedding anniversary of Josh and Aaron. I posted this on Facebook, I saw it. In my 40-year career, I don't think of any situation that was bathed in more prayer than Aaron and Josh, a year and a half of, of dying with cancer. So I'm estimating a million prayers, maybe more. And what did God say? So all those prayers. No. Let me ask you, what takes more faith? Go those year and a half and then go through that death experience or to have God heal you. So when God says no, it's not a reflection on your faith. It wasn't on Jesus. It wasn't on Paul. It wasn't on us that prayed for Aaron. It's a res- if we respond correctly, it will be a reflect- reflection of his grace. And here's the pushback. I don't want a God like that. A God that leaves a family, a husband without a wife and three small children without a mom. So here's your assignment for this week. 
pray you take this seriously. Really important question. Then what kind of God do you want? You need to decide that. You need to figure it out. And if you don't want a God like that, I'll wager you that the kind of God you want is you want to be God. You want to decide what happens. And it, it's really kind of funny because I picture it this way, you know, silly illustration. I pray for my team to win, and you pray for your team to win. And so God's up in there in heaven going, pulling his hair out. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Is that the kind of God you want? Especially when things are difficult. I think all of us want a God that there's big three alls. I won't use the omni words, but always present. And I'm down, I need, get, need your present. Uh, he knows everything, and he's all powerful. So he, can, he knows it, and he can fix it. That's, that's the kind of God I want. And the God we talked about last week says, I know. I know what you're going through. Uh, empathetic. If you experience it, I experience it. I know. You don't go through it alone. In that result, you and I are the miracle. But it's our choice. And the reason it's a choice is because love requires a choice. And a God that loves you enough to send his only son to die for you gives you the choice to believe in and to follow. Let me pray with you. Uh, Father God, th forgive us for wanting to be, take your place, <laughs> to be God. Help us understand your character, loving and powerful and knowing and gracious and merciful. I thank you we can come with you, to you with the deepest desires of our heart, but also knowing that sometimes you're going to say no. And it might not be for our good. It might be for a greater good, but ultimately for our good. So God, I pray for anyone that's listening, that's hearing this message, that we take seriously the question of what kind of God do they want? And if it's anything different than the God of the Bible, how is that going to work? And will it work? And we pray for anyone that, that has not taken that step of faith and truly trusts in you and as the foundation of their faith that, that you are resurrected and you are alive. Only religion ever existed where the founder is still alive. You, Jesus. So we pray that you would take that step of faith or take a step closer to believing in the one true God. Thank you, Jesus, for being our miracle. In your name we pray, amen. All right, one more week in this series of faith, and we'll move on to something else. Hopefully you can join us.